so it is uh, my proud privilege to introduce our guest lecturer for the day. She's Professor Barbara Laureate. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in law from King's College London. And her brief bio is actually quite impressive and very useful to anybody who wants to uh, be researching in her areas of specialization. So uh, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Professor Laureate who has focused on intellectual property law mainly. She has been a research fellow of the Oxford Intellectual Property Research Center in the University of Oxford Law Faculty, an adjunct associate professor at Notre Dame London Law Center, and an associate academic fellow of the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple. She serves on the editorial boards of Arbitration International and King's Law Journal, and is the academic consultant for Copinger and Scone, James on Copyright. Um, I have already informed her about uh, the student composition for the day, and she has uh, graciously agreed to tone down the lecture at a fundamental level to make it more interactive. So I would suggest, <coughs> as I read her, the abstract out for you, you can already start reflecting on any question that you might have and save it after she uh, delivers her address for us. Uh, the format would be as simple as an ordinary lecture, and she will address and share her paper. After which, uh, there'll be a brief summary to outline certain issues, and we'll open up the floor for questions and invite uh, faculty and students to engage and have pointed discussions, uh, which, which are of relevance to the paper that's being discussed. Um, mostly, you would understand that the theme is the origins of originality. And that is the fundament, a fundamental notion which underlines copyright law. Why should copyright law even protect an author's work? And what is the sine qua non which underlines copyright law, which is originality? And she discusses it through uh, a sort of a time travel all the way. And uh, she's unraveling the true story of Walter versus Lane, uh, a landmark worthy case, which she will probably demystify for us, is why it should not be considered that anymore. Um, so the abstract is, originality is a cornerstone of contemporary copyright law. In order to receive protection, works must be original. Yet throughout the Commonwealth, lawyers must rely on common law interpretations rather than statutory definitions to dele delineate the boundaries of originality of co for copyright purposes. One of the persistent challenges for the courts has been identifying when a copy of a work can itself be an original work. This question of protecting copies of others' works arose before originality was even a statutory requirement. So that's the conflict she will be highlighting for us. And she discusses the classic case of Walter West Lane, which is a 19th century case. The House of Lords decided that verbatim reports in the times of speeches given by the politician Lord Rosebery were protected under the existing copyright legislation. Walter West Lane is a seminal copyright case still cited in the 21st century judgments. But recent archival research has revealed it was also principled personal conflict with bodily head publisher John Lane and liberal editor Charles Geek on one side and Charles Frederick Bell, the managing director of the Times, on the other. So this feud caused great embarrassment and upset to Lord Rosebery himself, a friend of both Mr. Bell and Geek, who found himself caught in the middle. So this lecture will explore the true story behind Walter versus Lane and consider what, if any, lectures, uh, lessons the case can still teach us about copyright law today. And uh, she will traverse the entire journey of the case all the way in the United Kingdom, brings in some discussion about Australian copyright law. Are you mentioning a bit of that? Maybe, maybe she'll <laughs> limit that yet. Not today. <laughs> okay. And um, so uh, I'll extend a warm welcome to Barbara. And um, feel free to use your time as, as you like. Well, thank you so much. So I'm delighted to be at Jindal for the first time. I've heard so much about the law school, and um, as you can see, I've uh, got photos of both my usual uh, place of residence, Somerset House, um, at, uh, in, at King's, um, and also of the law school here. I think while they are very different buildings, they are both very impressive. And I think that's, I, I like a nice impressive building. It's, it's important to me, I think, to sort of feel validated by the architecture that's around you. So I am, I'm delighted to, to be here, as I said. Now I have um, two sort of, a confession and an apology, really. One is the, uh, the confession is that uh, the origins of originality, the true story of Walter and Lane, all right, it's not really the origins of originality. That was just kind of because it sounded catchy. 
So it's, um, it, you, we could trace originality back further than this if we want to be pedantic about it, but yeah, I liked the title. The other uh, apology is that, as you probably gathered at this point, I am not English. <laughs> so I may be from King's College London, but I am American. So um, my apologies if you were expecting some really, really nice, posh English accent. Uh, <laughs> not much I can do about it, sorry. Um, so we will begin. I gather that, um, actually, who here has um, has studied copyright law already. Who is familiar with copyright law already? Okay, good. We're going to start with the basics. So, originality and copyright. So, this is an example from the UK Copyright Designs and Patents Act. And we see that uh, copyright is a property right which subsists in accordance with the part in the following descriptions of work original, literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work. So, we often will um, call those LDMA works, so original LDMA works. And I've got examples on the slide of some of the um, you know, illustrations of these kinds of LDMA works. We've got um, this um, Druzout, this famous Druzout portrait of William Shakespeare. So that is an artistic work. We've got um, a copy of Shakespeare's poems, so that would be a literary work. We've got a photograph taken of a performance of a Shakespeare play, so that would be a dramatic work. And then we've got up in the corner a photo of a CD cover for um, some songs from Shakespeare's time. I, you're sensing a theme here, you know. It's, <laughs> um, so songs of Shakespeare's time, obviously a musical work. Now, it's not just uh, British copyright that has this concept of originality. It really is key for most copyright systems. So being American, US copyright also requires originality for every kind of work, not just LDMA works, but for all works. So we see that, I'm not gonna read through the statute and bore you, but we can see that originality is highlighted here. They have to be original works in order to receive protection under the law. And India Copyright Act, we also have um, a very similar to the UK, um, the CDPA, we have protection for original LDMA works. So originality is crucial in all of these legal systems. But what's originality? Now, I, if I'm not really sure what something means, and originality has lots of different meanings, we look to the Oxford English Dictionary. So look to the Oxford English Dictionary. And there are lots of uh, possible meanings. So kind of going through some of the possible meanings of originality, what does original mean, we've got the origin or source of something from which something springs, proceeds, or is derived, primary. That's not really the meaning that we think about when we are trying to identify if a work is original. Right. Um, so two, belonging to the beginning or earliest stage of something, existing at or from the first, earliest, first in time. Well, that's, no, this you, when you say that something's from, you know, from birth or nature, if you say originally, I, I was originally from America before I moved to England, that's not the right kind of original either. So we can get rid of definition two. Definition three, designating the external jugular vein. No, definitely not that one. That's from an, an anatomical uh, uh, definition. Four, of the same origin, having the same ancestry or native of the same place. That's kind of the same sort of thing of Origin, you know, I was originally from the US. Five, created, composed, or done by a person directly, produced firsthand, not imitated or copied from another. So this might, this is getting closer. So something is original if it's not imitated or copied from another. So we're gonna, number five, that gets us somewhere. Uh, six, having the quality of that which proceeds directly from oneself such as has not been done or produced before, novel or fresh in character or style. Now that's more the definition that we'd think of when you read a novel and you think, oh, that was a really original idea, or you see a TV show and you think, oh, that's, that's really original. I've never seen something done in that concept before. But that is not the kind of originality we think of when we're dealing with copyright law. It's not original as in novel or fresh or different or cool. It's not novel in that, that it's not original in that kind of positive complementary sense. Um, 
and then we can also use this, a person can be described as original if they come up with these kind of fresh novel ideas. But you know, it's, really, it's really the number five that is closest to what we would think of as the legal definition. This kind of not deriving from or depending on any other thing, um, you know, not copied, basically. So we've got an idea of the definition. But originality and copyright is a very low threshold. So we don't want judges or lawyers, we don't trust judges or lawyers to be making aesthetic judgments about what is original or you know, what in a kind of qualitative sense. We don't want um, to have a qualitative judgment in the law of determining what's going to be protected by copyright. So we have this very low threshold and you can see this illustrated in my own particular original artistic work Slim mixed stick figure, I call it. Ballpoint pen on paper, you see copyright 2017. But wait, you say, you know, this is a stick figure. You're gonna give copyright protection to a stick figure? Yes, yes we are. Now maybe if it was just a stick figure, like the very simplest version of stick figure, it would not be protected because that's something that's kind of part of the public domain and I would just be copying that. But I've made these very minimal judgments here and choices, creative choices, uh, creative choices. Uh, I have included on my stick figure a jaunty hat. See my jaunty hat? I have made the inexplicable creative choice of making the limbs wider than the body of the stick figure. Why did I do that? I don't know, but I made these choices. They may be bad choices. But the law doesn't care about the creative, the aesthetic quality of the copyright work. It just cares about it being original and a, an artistic work. So artistic work, very low threshold. We don't want judges saying what art is. Similarly, for literary works, literary works can be very, very simple, very short, and still receive copyright protection. So for example, in some European cases, we've had um, judgments that you can have a newspaper headline be protected by copyright as a literary work itself. So apart from the um, actual article that it's attached to. So originality in copyright, a very, very low threshold. And no, I'm not gonna sing. <laughs> but what about, we said that to be original, it can't be copied. But what does it mean to be a copy? Can you have originality of copies? So earlier I showed you a, a picture, this Drujat po um, <coughs> portrait of um, William Shakespeare. And this has been copied a million times, maybe not a million, but many times. And we see these other copies of this portrait. And are these also going to receive copyright protection? Have they done enough or are they not as copies? And it's very difficult to navigate this question of when is a copy of an earlier work going to be original? And what is a copy? And certainly we see this one in, or in the corner in the, with the yellow background and that's, that's clearly going to be something that's, that's different. That's not a copy as such, but it is a copy at some level. It was certainly inspired by the central portrait. And Shakespeare is a good example. We've got lots of um, subsequent works that have been based on Shakespeare's work. So we have the classic you know, West Side Story based on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, taking that central theme. Now maybe if Romeo and Juliet had been protected by copyright at the time that West Side Story was written, then we might have that it might have been considered infringing. But is it original? We have to kind of separate these questions of whether something is infringing from whether it is original. And clearly, it was not infringing because um, Romeo and Juliet was, it's a very old work, just as Hamlet is a very old work. No one would, is going to object, Shakespeare's heirs are not going to object when they make it into a film um, later on. But that film, is that film a copy, this derivative work based on the earlier work? But let's get even more complicated. Now, we said that Hamlet's an old work, 
but, and that it's out of copyright, so it doesn't matter if someone makes a film out of it. But I'm sorry, you probably can't see this entirely clearly, so I'll tell you that in this photo, we've got some modern editions of Hamlet. So obviously, Hamlet written hundreds of years ago, but in this modern edition, um, Penguin Random House edition of Hamlet, which I actually took this, I, I took this photograph in a bookstore in Wellington, New Zealand a couple of weeks ago. I'll tell you, the bookstore person was, thought I was pretty strange when I asked her to hold the book open for me so I could take photos of it, and then didn't buy anything. She loved that. But, you know, this was all, it's all for the pursuit of research, right? Um, this, you might be able to see better in this photo, possibly. But in this photo, we see that this edition, first published by Penguin Books, 1980, this edition copyright Penguin Books, 1980-1996. Penguin is claiming copyright in this edition of Hamlet. So how can that be? How can they say we have copyright in this play, this edition of this play that was written hundreds of years ago by somebody else? And what they would argue is that the editors of this edition had to look at all of these different sources. They had to be scholars who were expert in Shakespeare's work, who um, were able to look at these original sources and try to figure out what the authoritative text, based on all these different varieties of texts, would be. So that they have put in this skill, labor, and judgment, and this, in this really intellectual labor, to create an edition of this work that um, is they, what they consider to be the authoritative text of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And they claim a copyright in that edition, not in Hamlet as a whole. So anybody could do the same thing, take the original text and come up with their own edition. But what they're saying is, we have a thin copyright. So we have a thin copyright in that you can't use our edition. Now, do they or don't they actually have a copyright is the question. They're claiming it, but claiming to have copyright protection. Putting a little encircled C in the front of your book does not actually mean you have copyright. They're asserting copyright protection, but do they legally? Maybe, maybe not. It's not entirely clear, to be honest. Um, another example of a difficult question, what about when somebody restores an old painting. So again, continuing with the Shakespeare theme, we've got this old, the 17th century painting, supposedly of Shakespeare, painted on wood, really deteriorated. And some um, expert in, in art restoration has been able to, to fix the painting. And, and obviously, this takes a certain amount of expertise, um, intellectual labor, and, and indeed choices in trying to restore an oil painting into something um, that it resembles the original character of the, the painting. And yet, this isn't original <coughs> in any sense that we would think of um, looking at those OED definitions. And, but should it get copyright protection? Should we have copyright protection for something that is, in a sense, a, a restoration or in the case of the Shakespeare, that is just a new edition. And copyright law is very unclear on this. Um, in the case of a musical work, so I said that getting to, towards Walter and Lane, that this actually came up in a 21st century case. And that's the case, the English case of Sawkins and Hyperion Records. In this case, there was a, um, an expert, a musicologist, Dr. Lionel Sawkins, who is one of the world experts on kind of court music of the 17th and 18th centuries, French court music of the 17th and 18th centuries. And he, was, um, he, he spent years trying to render the works of this, um, this French um, composer, De La Lande, uh, to be playable by modern instruments. He wanted to create versions that could be played by modern instruments and that would also correct some of the errors that had been made in 19th century editions of the works of Lalande. So he spends years doing this and really it, there, he, he might have been in fact the only person in the world capable of doing this. But what he was doing, it was not necessarily changing notes 
as such. Not the way that, so I'm uned, totally uneducated in all things musical, so um, I, I would normally think, oh, well, this would involve changing notes. But no, he was doing all sorts of fancy technical things that don't have to do with changing notes. And he supposedly made about 3,000 changes in these compositions. But Hyperion Records, who was producing the um, CD, they claimed that he did not have a copyright. So Sokin said, well, I have, I am the author, I am the creator, even though Lalonde was the original composer, I'm the author of these playable editions. I have a copyright. And Hyperion Records said, no, you don't. They ended up in the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal said, Dr. Sawkins did have copyright, that his versions were musical works and that they were original musical works. And in saying that they were original musical works, they cite, um, Lord Justice Mummery cited this case of Walter and Lane, saying that the essential elements of originality were expounded by the House of Lords over a century ago in Walter and Lane. It remains good law, he said. The House of Lords held that copyright subsisted in shorthand writers' reports of public speeches as original literary works. So he's saying that the House of Lords said over a century ago that when a shorthand writer takes down a verbatim report of someone giving a speech, then that shorthand reporter gets their own copyright, even though this is, in a sense, a copy itself. But that's actually not what the case held at all. Uh, with all due respect to Lord Justice Mummery, who's a lovely man, he got it dead wrong. Because if we actually look at Walter and Lane, it says something pretty much the, well, the holding is right in that they did have copyright, but as far as originality is concerned, Lord Halsbury, the producer of this written composition is to my mind the person who is the author of the book within the meaning of the statute, and as I have pointed out, the words original composer are not to be found in the statute at all. And then Lord Davy, copyright has nothing to do with originality or literary merits of the author or composer. So if we go back and see, you know, the House of Lords held that copyright subsisted in shorthand writers' reports of public speeches as original literary works. Well, no, they didn't. They said that there was copyright in the reports, but they did not say that they were original literary works because that was not the language of the statute at the time, the 1842 Act. The 1842 <coughs> Act protected the authors of books. It protected the authors of books. So were the speeches books? No. Um, but now that Walter and Lane, as of this uh, Sawkins and Hyperion, had, had been stated as being good law, this raised two questions for me. So as a, as a sort of scholar and as a, as a historian, I was curious about a couple of things about this case of Walter and Lane, which um, Mummery and, and the other judges in the Court of Appeal had said was good law. And so one of them was obviously this kind of question of, well, the holding, what they said was the holding was not quite the holding. But I have two other questions. One is that whenever I teach this, um, this case of Walter and Lane, which was about Lord Rosebery, who was a politician and a, and a um, public figure in the late 19th century, giving speeches, the Times reporters takes them down, and then the Times claims that they have copyright in the speeches. So that's the overall structure. Whenever I would teach this, the students would inevitably say, but what about Lord Rosebery? Why isn't Lord Rosebery the author of the speeches? What, what's he doing in all of this? So one of my questions was, well, what is Lord Rosebery doing in all of this? And can I find out? Um, so I wanted to answer that question. And the other question that I had, well, as a lawyer, was why are they fighting about this? There is no money involved. <laughs> why are they taking this up to the House of Lords? This makes no sense. The Times has already published their newspapers with the speeches in them. You know, they're not really going to get anything from a licensing fee anyway. That's not really something that's done at the time. And uh, you know, so why is the Times actually continuing to fight this? It was very, certainly very unclear 
at, at this point that they would get copyright, um, and the Court of Appeal said they didn't have copyright. So, so yeah. So that was my question: is given that there's no money involved, why is the Times fighting this? As well as my students' question that they had every year, which is, what is Lord Rosebery doing in all of this, and why isn't he the author? So I decided I was going to go into the archives and answer my questions. And I'm happy to say that I did find answers to my questions. So this is just an example of um, the book that was at issue in the case of Walter and Lane, Appreciations and Addresses by Lord Rosebery. So one of the first things, and this was just this collection of the speeches of um, Lord Rosebery that the publisher John Lane had decided to, to compile together and, uh, and publish. And one of the first things I discovered was that this was not the first edition of the speeches or of speeches of Lord Rosebery to be published. I discovered that there had been a few years before this book was published another edition of the speeches of Lord Rosebery by publisher Neville Beeman. And so I thought, well, okay, if somebody else is publishing Times reports of the speeches of Lord Rosebery, well, why didn't the Times object earlier? So I tracked down a copy of this book, and it was very easy to find the answer to that question because I opened right to the prefatory note, and it said, you know, something along the lines of, with, with our gratitude towards um, Charles Frederick Moberly Bell and the Times for giving us permission to publish <laughs> these speeches. So my answer was there. They, Neville Beeman, had written to the Times, not to Lord Rosebery, of course, but had written to the Times to ask their permission for publishing the speeches. Didn't pay them any money, didn't pay them any money, but asked permission. And that was the crucial thing, and received permission. So there was an earlier book. I started looking into Lord Rosebery himself. So here's a picture of um, Archibald Philip Primrose, who was the fifth Earl of Rosebery. He became Earl fairly young. Um, he was studying at Oxford at the time um, that he inherited the, the earldom, and he very shortly after dropped out because he decided he would have much more fun um, spending his money and, uh, and gambling on horse races than he would studying. So um, he was a great fan of horse racing. So that was one of his driving passions in his life. He, um, he was um, insanely wealthy. He was like really very, very wealthy, um, particularly because eventually he married his wife, Hannah Rothschild Primrose. Emphasis on the Rothschild. She was even wealthier than he was. So they were, they were doing pretty well for themselves. And they had loads of properties, like huge you know, mansions. You make Downton Abbey look like a, you know, a shack. Um, like they really they had a lot of money. And he also, which is what, what's little remembered, he was prime minister less than a year, but he was prime minister, 1894, 1895. So he, um, was, he was a reasonably successful politician, but I think also he, he was not, not incredibly energetic and he was not very driven for his career in politics. And so he, um, when, his, um, when it didn't work out, he didn't persist too long and kind of dropped out of politics. So he's a politician, but what he also was very good at um, was giving kind of after dinner type speeches. So he was like one of these people, you know, we still have them today, where they're you know, the go-to person when you need someone to give a kind of witty after dinner speech or open a golf course. I mean, literally he did, you know, there's a speech in there, him opening a golf course or, um, you know, talking at somebody's funeral. He was just a good, he was a good solid um, speaker at sort of, ordinary occasions. And that was what they were publishing um, in this collection by John Lane. We're just these uh, collection of sort of random speeches. Uh, and he, uh, he, however, did not like his um, speeches to be published. So he, he liked to give them orally, but he didn't like the fact that they would be published in the newspapers. Uh, so now, 
that's the, the first question is sort of who is Lord Rosebery? The second question is who is this Moberly Bell? As I said, the, the gratitude of Neville Beeman was to the Times and Moberly Bell. So I started looking into Moberly Bell. So Charles Frederick Moberly Bell is our next character in the story. And he was the managing director of the Times during the time of this dispute. He um, he'd actually spent time in India. And he was called back to, um, to work for the Times when the owners of the, you know, the Times at this point was basically a family business. Uh, the Walter family owned the Times, and it was not doing well. So we near, the Times nearly <coughs> collapsed at this point because they were trying to run it as a family business. It wasn't going terribly well, and Arthur Walter decided he needed to get in a professional. So he hired Moberly Bell to run the Times. And Moberly Bell did help in kind of getting it out of a, a ditch. He, um, he had came up with the idea for the Times Literary Supplement and various other ideas. So he, he got it back on track. He, but he was absolutely um, incensed by the fact that during the 19th century, remember I said that copyright protected books? It protected authors of books. It wasn't entirely clear that a newspaper was a book. So you had rampant copying of newspaper articles. Uh, all the time you would have um, competing newspapers lifting articles, sometimes just entirely from the Times, and publishing them themselves. And as Moberly Bell is struggling to kind of get the Times back on track, he's very frustrated by the constant copying that's going on, whether it's ab absolutely verbatim copying or whether it is um, simply taking the stories and then reshaping them. Either way, he finds this very frustrating. So he goes on a campaign to change the law to get legal protection for newspapers. And not just for newspapers, um, he, he wants not just for the newspaper articles, uh, which he succeeds in, in getting the newspaper articles um, defined as, as books. So he gets the legal protection um, through ca a case that he brings to protect them as books. But he also actually wants copyright in news. Uh, there is a select committee of the House of Lords um, to look into this question of copyright in newspapers, copyright in news. And Moberly Bell goes before them and he says, we should have absolute copyright in news. So not just the literary expression, but the content that he says that the Times invests in foreign correspondence. Remember, this is, this is it's the 19th century. It's difficult and expensive to send people abroad to report on um, activities that are happening in foreign parts, and they have to then wire them back. And it's all, it's all very expensive. So he's saying that if I send one of my correspondents abroad, and I, you know, the Times spends this money, that when they get the big scoop, they are the first to find out about a war or an assassination elsewhere in the world, that the Times should basically have an exclusive. So he was going too far. There was no way, there was no way that the law was ever going to be changed to protect that much to say that you can't copy the Times and saying that there's a war happening because that would be ridiculous. Nevertheless, it's fair to say that Moberly Bell did have a basis for his frustrations uh, we see Augustine Burrell, who is another character we'll come back to, writing in 1899 that you know, nobody can read the newspapers without becoming aware of the fact that an enormous amount of da daily pilfering goes on. Sometimes, at the very end of a long and seemingly original paragraph, you may discover in a parenthesis to a rival print from which the whole has been conveyed. So Moberly Bell will just say he is on, he's on a mission. He wants to get stronger protection for newspapers, and that is why he's fighting this case so hard. He was okay with Neville Beeman because he got per Neville Beeman asked for permission, but when the next character comes along, John Lane does not ask for permission. So John Lane uh, is a publisher. He's a fascinating character. He's a totally self-made man. Um, completely, he taught. He didn't have any proper education taught himself everything he knew, got into the publishing industry, and <coughs> made a great success of it uh, with Bodley Head Publishers. So he thinks there's money to be made 
by gathering together the speeches of Lord Rosebery and publishing them. He writes to Lord Rosebery, and I found this letter, he writes to Lord Rosebery and asks for permission. Lord Rosebery writes back and says, basically, no way, <laughs> no way. Um, so this is actually from an earlier published work of Lord Rosebery. He's not talking about his own speeches, but he says few speeches which have produced an electrical effect on an audience can bear the colorless photography of a printed record. So Rosebery writes back to Lane and says, look, I, I don't want, to, okay, I may be paraphrasing here, but he says, look, I don't want you to publish my speeches. They're not that good. I wish they would just go away. I wish they'd never been published in the Times in the first place. Don't publish my speeches, please. But I know that there's nothing I can do because I don't have copyright in the speeches because he didn't go through the formalities. At the time, you had formalities for obtaining copyright, and he didn't do that. So he knows he has no copyright in the speeches. Can't actually stop Lane from doing it. So Lane goes ahead, and in fact, he gets a friend, as I said um, in the abstract, he gets a friend of Lord Rosebery, Charles Geek, to be the editor of the volume. Now, Charles Geek, I don't have a photo of him, but Charles Geek is, um, a, he's a, he's, a liber, he's a member of the same party as Lord Rosebery, and he is um, the editor of the kind of the Liberal Party journal, and he um, is enthusiastic. He thinks that these should be preserved for posterity. He's a great admirer of Rosebery, thinks the speeches are great, and wants to protect them. So now I'm just going to read a couple of the letters that they, um, they wrote to each other. So what happened was um, Lane... John Lane and Charles Geek, they prepare the book, and Lane goes off to America to do some sales work. And Geek gets the entire copy of the book in proof, and he sends it to uh, Lord Rosebery. Lord Rosebery at the time is at one of his lovely properties in Naples, Italy. So it takes a little while for the letter to get to him. But Lord Rosebery is in, in Naples, you know, probably enjoying, enjoying a lovely Bellini on the terrace or something, and he <laughs> receives the letter from Geek. And he writes back immediately, he says, I have just you received your letter on arriving here. It made me perfectly sick. I thought that my letter had dismissed all suggestion of republishing any speeches of mine. My opinion is not at all changed. And then he goes on, and he, he clearly disapproves. So Geek receives this letter, and as I said, he's an admirer and a friend of Lord Rosebery, and thinks, oh, we've made a mistake. We really shouldn't go forward with publishing this book. It's going to embarrass Lord Rosebery, and it's, he's very worried about this. And Lane had told him he wanted him to go ahead and publish as soon as possible. But Geek thinks, uh, Lane's in America, and he, I don't know what to do, and so he holds off for a little while on publishing the volume. But then there's a bit of a misunderstanding because Rosebery writes to his secretary, Waterfield, who's based in London and is working over at um, 38 Barclay Square, another one of the lovely properties. And Waterfield, the secretary, gets this letter from Rosebery saying that, you know, that these guys are planning a, a book. Um, they've got lots of things wrong. Now, can you write to them and say that if they must publish this edition of my speeches, at least consult the copies that I have in 38 Barclay Square, where they were keeping clippings with corrections, at least let them consult this so that they get it right. If they must publish the thing, at least let them get it right. So Waterfield writes to Geek, and Geek takes this suggestion that he correct the proofs as a kind of implicit um, approval for the project. So he misinterprets that and thinks, oh, actually, maybe Rosebery thinks it's okay after all. Um, and they go forward with publishing the book. Now, immediately, on the day of publication, the Times has got wind of this, and the Times solicitors write to John Lane, the publisher, um, threatening to sue if he doesn't withdraw the publication. So we've got the Times on one side saying, um, you know, uh, Moberly Bell in particular, on, him, on his mission to get more protection for books. We've got um, John Lane, the publisher, wanting to get this book out, knowing in his mind that Rosebery doesn't have any rights, believing that the Times doesn't have any rights in the speeches. 
and we have Charles Geek, who's just completely upset and bewildered by this whole thing, to be perfectly honest. Um, and Geek now, now has to write to Roseberry um, to make sure that he's aware that this might actually turn into a lawsuit. So Geek writes to Roseberry and says, as I dare say, you will have seen the Times take appreciations and addresses to be an infringement of their copyright and have actually decided to bring an action against Mr. Lane. We had heard something of this 10 days ago, but hearing nothing for a week from the Times, we thought that their second thoughts were not to pursue the matter. Of course, Mr. Lane will defend the action, for we believe the Times is wrong and that we are right. Mr. Lane is going to brief Burl. I mentioned him before, who thinks, as he told me a week ago as a friend, that it was like impudence of the times to assume a copyright to which certainly and clearly they were not entitled. This will now have to be decided by the courts, and the action for the injunction may be on in a few days. Perhaps you will tell me if the times has in any way told you what they are doing. They already know your exact position about the book, uh, and then he goes on. Uh, so Roseberry gets this letter, and he is um, not happy about this. He's not happy about the publication, and he's really not happy about the lawsuit. And so I found these letters from Roseberry in the archives that do say, well, this is, this is what he did, and this is the position he took in the lawsuit. He was involved in it. He was just involved behind the scenes. So he writes back to Geek and says, your note places me in a very difficult position. I already t told you strongly from the first um, that I opposed any taking up of these ill-considered fragments. And as you know, I had no idea of Mr. Lane's intentions until you sent me the book in proof. Secondly, I cannot agree that I authorize any transcripts of my revised edition. <clears throat> he goes on, um, but is this volume worth a lawsuit? Would it not be better simply to express your indebtedness to the times and your regret that you should have not <coughs> acknowledged this sooner? I hate the law, I hate lawsuits, and I particularly hate being the corpus delicti. <laughs> so Roseberry also um, writes to Moberly Bell. So Roseberry, friends with Geek, also friends with Moberly Bell. I told you that Moberly Bell had set up the Times Literary Supplement. Roseberry was one of his first authors that he approached to write for it. So Roseberry thinks, all right, I'm going to try to stop this lawsuit from happening. I really don't want it to happen, and I'm just, if maybe I can just sort of get the parties to agree. Particularly, as I said it from the beginning, no money is at stake here, really. So Roseberry writes to Moberly Bell, my dear Mr. <coughs> Bell, I suppose you as manager of the Times are the source of the lawsuit that is about to rage over my body, or rather more strictly over my remains and I write to ask if it be not possible to avert it. I have shunned law like a pestilence all my life, and it seems hard that in my declining years I should be dragged into a dispute with which I have nothing to do. I am now bombarded by both sides, and so far as I can see, am expected to play a leading part. <coughs> How I beg you to spare me this. Surely an acknowledgement from Mr. Lane will meet your point, and that I understand he is willing to give. Anyhow, I selfishly ask to be left alone and that the, your copyright be tested on some other vile corpus than that of yours sincerely, Roseberry. And then he writes, if I am wrong in addressing you, pray, pray forgive my troubling you. Uh, I couldn't find Moberly Bell's response to this, but he, he, it's clear that he said, no way, I'm going forward with a lawsuit. This is a, it's a, a matter of principle. And so, Roseberry writes back to Moberly Bell and says, all right, cursed are the peacemakers as usual. Um, he goes on, but anyhow, all that I have ever asked for my speeches is that they be decently forgotten, and now I suppose your action will only advertise Lane's book. So the lawsuit goes forward, as we know, and from that point, um, we see that uh, Scruton, T.E. Scruton, and Augustine Burrell, who I mentioned earlier, are the lawyers. They're, they're, they're the counsel for Lane, um, Lane and Geek uh, in opposing the Times. And these were two of the most eminent copyright experts of the day. And as we heard from Geek's letter, both of them, well, Burrell and Scruton, were absolutely convinced that the Times was wrong, that they, they did not have a copyright in the verbatim reports of the speeches. 
And so they fought it. And they, in the Court of Appeal, were, they tried to introduce this element of originality in their arguments. And they were able to persuade the Court of Appeal that even though originality was not explicitly mentioned in the statute, the 1842 Act, it was still a necessary part of what we are protecting in a copyright work, that a copyright work, that authorship requires some element of originality. But they, of course, were not successful. And one of the reasons they were not successful in the Lords is because of this idea that we see expressed in the judgment of Lord Halsbury, saying, my Lords, I should very much regret if I were compelled to come to the conclusion that the state of the law permitted one man to make profit and to appropriate to himself the labor, skill, and capital of another. So Halsbury is expressing what we might think of as a kind of unjust enrichment argument, you know, that you are reaping where someone else has sown. The Times put in an investment, and Lane is capitalizing on that investment. And those of us who are intellectual property scholars know that unjust enrichment is perhaps not the strongest argument to build a case on in, in intellectual property because we like some copying, we don't like other copying. Some copying we'd say is good, other copying would say is not good. It's not as clear cut as if it's worth copying, it's worth protecting. It's a very dangerous road to go down. So, I think that um, Halsbury's judgment is not where we find the most interesting argument in the Lords and Walter and Lane. And now I want to get to my, my point that I promised in saying, well, what can we get from Walter and Lane? I've already told you that um, the Court of Appeal in Sawkins and Hyperion, they misstated the holding. And um, they didn't have originality as a requirement in the 1842 Act. And obviously, the law has progressed in, in, um, in many jurisdictions past this idea of unjust enrichment being always bad. So what do we get out of Walter and Lane? And I would argue we can actually find it in um, the, actually skip that, in Lord Brampton's, in Lord Brampton's um, judgment. He says, it is obvious that the preparation of the reports involved considerable intellectual skill and brain labor beyond the mere mechanical operation of writing. True it is that the reporter was not the <coughs> author of the speech, but he was the composer and author of the book. Without his brain and handiwork, the book would never have had existence, and the words of Lord Rosebery would have remained unrecorded, save in the memories of the comparatively few who were present on those occasions. So what Lord Brampton is saying is that not only was their skill and labor involved in creating those verbatim reports, but they would have been lost to the public had those reporters not taken them down. So the first point, intellectual skill and labor in actually making the copies. Now, one of the things that came out, if you look at the, um, the trial court level for this case, is that from a factual perspective, if you compared these supposedly verbatim reports of all of these different um, reporters who would attend a single speech, they would all be different. None of them would be the same. So we say this is a copy of a speech, but when you write down a shorthand report of a speech, you are doing a lot of intellectual labor. And then in turning that into readable prose afterwards, you've got to put in punctuation, you've got to fill in spaces, you've got to um, get rid of the um, ums <laughs> that people inevitably include in any kind of oral address that they're not reading out loud. So that work was intellectual skill and labor. So that's one point. And then the second point he makes is that we would not have the speeches. The speeches, which of course is what Lord Rosebery wanted, he wanted them to disappear. But maybe the public doesn't want them to disappear. Maybe the public wants to have those speeches and maybe it's a good thing they were preserved. And that's what we get from Lord Brampton. And we see this kind of sentiment, even though it's not cited directly, echoed in, um, here, oh here we go, in Sawkins, in Hyperion, 
from Lord Justice Jacob. A you know, lovely photo of uh, Lord. He's a colleague of mine, actually. We, uh, he, we, um, we, he teaches at UCL and comes and heckles my lectures sometimes. Anyway, so um, the Lord Justice Jacob, as he was, he points out that the sort of work done by the claimant should be encouraged. It saves others the time and trouble of recreation of near lost works, but in no sense creates a monopoly in them. If someone wants to use the claimant's shortcut, they need his permission. So he, we have some support for Lord Brampton's um, position. So here are some examples, and I would argue that this is the lesson that we get from Walter and Lane. Here are some examples of the kind of works that I think might be protected as original, even though they are in some sense copies of other works. So here we have um, the example of a restoration of a painting. Uh, here's a da Vinci painting, John the Baptist. It's, um, it's it's fading so much and getting darkened and dirty to a, a point where um, eventually it's not going to be appreciated by members of the public. To be able to restore a painting like that is an act of considerable skill, labor, and judgment, um, and is something that we certainly want preserved for the public. Um, we have examples down below in the uh, left corner of mu ancient music. To be able to recreate ancient music um, in a way that might be heard by the public today. It's not creating an original work. In a sense, it's copying, yet obviously this requires great expertise, great scholarship in order to be able to do this. Similarly, with the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, so this was a case um, in Israel, the Dead Sea Scrolls, to be able to take these disparate fragments, put them together, and then actually translate and read something from them that's coherent, takes years and years and years of expertise and labor. Or even a more recent example, um, the poems of T.S. Eliot. This is a work that just came out last year. This is an edition of poems that are still in copyright, um, most of them. And these poems, even though we think of them as having been published fairly recently, even a, um, a seminal Eliot poem like The Wasteland actually was published first published in four different editions, all of which are different. Subsequent editions have all been different as well. This, it took years to, and, uh, to look at letters, to compare different editions, to figure out what Eliot had said about the poems himself, to come up with something that is an authoritative edition of an Eliot poem. And so I would argue that our understanding of copyright law, our understanding of originality, can encompass certain kinds of copies, certain kinds of works that are themselves copies. And I would propose a, a kind of two-part test to determine when that's the case. And I'm not saying that all of these works would necessarily qualify. These are just examples of things that I think might. My two-part test would be, first, whether the, it involves the kind of intellectual skill, labor, and judgment um, in doing the copying. So we're not talking about pressing, you know, record you know, on, on a tape recorder. Not that anyone uses tape recorders these days, but you know what I mean. Um, not, we're not talking about pressing record on your mobile phone. Um, we're ta talking about putting something in a photocopy or a scanner. We're talking about this kind of intellectual labor that requires specialized um, skill and knowledge and often takes a very long time. And then the second part of the test, I would suggest be that, it be that there be a kind of compelling public interest in having that kind of work done. So having it be something that we value um, as a public. Now, would Roseberry's speeches qualify under my proposed test, the reporters of the Times? I would say, from what I have read in, in the case, that probably they would. So controversially, I'm actually saying that the House of Lords was right in protecting those reports of the speeches, or probably right, in that, as I told you, those verbatim reports, they all varied. So reports of speeches inevitably varied. The reporters had to take down those notes and they had to, to turn it into something that was readable in the reports. And also, this is something that would have been lost. This was something of public interest. These were the speeches of a public figure, a politician, and that they would have been lost otherwise, even though perhaps they were only um, speeches about opening golf courses and libraries. 
Um, but still, there was a sufficient public interest in that. So I think that even Lord Rosebery's speeches, uh, the reports of the speeches, would meet my test. So that is what I think we can get from the case of Walter and Lane. Now, we already talked about that. A little bit of a postscript before I let you go. Just a little bit of a postscript. So what happened to all of the characters I talked about? So we have um, up in the right corner, you see the penguin. John Lane, the publisher, continued to be a successful publisher. Bodley had publishing, uh, published his own book, The Champagne Standard. Incidentally, the appreciations and addresses did very well in the United States because they thought that this had been suppressed in England and that meant that it was obscene. So it sold incredibly well. <laughs> so he did all right for himself. And in fact, his nephews, the reason the penguin is up there, his nephews, three of his nephews got together and started penguin books. So it all comes full circle. Uh, then we have a picture of Scruton this copyright expert, a um, number of editions of his copyright treatise were published. He became a judge, uh, quite a successful judge. So he, he did all right, too. Um, Charles Geek, the uh, editor, he ended up having a mild, a more moderate success publishing John Bull's Adventures in Fiscal Wonderland, which was a parody of Alice in Wonderland relating to economic policy of the time. And then Lord Rosebery himself, he... Um, he continued, his, well, after his wife's death, he really retired mostly from politics, continued to give the occasional speech, um, but increasing, you know, decreasingly. His health failed, I'm afraid, but he still enjoyed horse racing um, up until the end. And, you know, of course, you know, he didn't exactly die a pauper. And then finally, um, Moberly Bell. So, uh -huh. Moberly Bell. So Moberly Bell never ended his campaign to try to get stronger copyright protection in news. He continued, and uh, in 1911, on the 5th of April, 1911, Moberly Bell was really upset because he was, had just been reading a report of a draft bill before Parliament, a draft copyright bill. And he was very upset about this because there was a provision in there that would basically open up newspaper articles for copying, provided a certain, um, a little notice was given saying that uh, th th this was from the um, original source. So he, he's really upset about this, and he sits down at his, his desk, he's all riled up, and he writes a letter to um, Sidney Buxton, who's the president of the Board of Trade and who's supporting this bill. So he writes to Buxton, although a unionist, I am not one of those who has hitherto associated the whole of cabinet with a desire to plunder other roosts. But when I see names such as yours and the Solicitor General's to a copyright bill containing Article 21, I begin to wonder whether my moderation has not been a mistake and whether Cabinet really proposes to legalize burglary and larceny, provided the delinquent will only confess. There is something to be said for it, I admit, and the next time I have the pleasure of calling on Mrs. Buxton, I shall try to pick up some unconsidered trifle and on my way home, shall call at a police office, explain that it is the property of Mrs. Buxton, show that it has no certificate of property attached to it, and treat it as my own until someone else manages to abstract it from me in the same manner. So not, a, not happy with the uh, proposed amendments in the copyright bill. He never finishes the letter, though. He never finishes the letter to Sidney Buxton because he gets so worked up, he puts down his pen and keels over dead. So a proponent of you know, fighting for copyright laws to the very end. And I will say that the 1911 Act did not end up containing the uh, provision that got him so upset on the day he died. So that is the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Minor marginal uh, difference in understanding 
to what extent is authorship and originality connected? And this case, which is Landmark Worthy, kind of explains the merits of the right which copyright actually wants to protect, which is an economic right, actually. And this case, uh, as, as Barbara very wonderfully kind of underlined, there was probably no issue at hand. It, it should, have, should not even have gone to court in the first place, at least if Mr. Rosemary, uh, if the Earl had any kind of uh, inclination to really stop it, could have done that right in the beginning uh, without this miscommunication being conflagrated into such a long um, tedious affair. But the copyright law did mature enough to, to ensure that uh, the very failure of, this, of, of uh, Rosemary not having completed the statutory requirements of actually um, uh, keeping the authorship with him um, kept him out of this debate to a large extent. And so it was more about a debate between two intermediaries <coughs> who, who had the economic right of making money out of the speeches that were delivered by Mr. Rosemary, Rosemary and adequately reported. So present time and age and the Indian standard right now has uh, shifted remarkably from uh, the sweat of the brow doctrine, which was just the minor efforts uh, and the labor to collect information and have it in a tangible medium uh, available for consumers to enjoy and, uh, and thereby perceive that whoever is the consumer uses it to the advantage and is inspired enough and incentivized enough to become a follower or to create the same work. Uh, but what's interesting though, I love uh, the two aspects of the test that you kind of underlined here on the narrative that the first, uh, a mere labor or mere effort which is devoid of intellect should not be a standard at all. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what is being adopted right now okay, in several common law jurisdictions, including India, which is a borrow from the Canadian standard of skill and judgment. It's generally, you must have a specialized skill to even apply your mind to create something which is of that standard of originality and not just meaning that it originates from an author and therefore the value of the author comes from the intellectual application. So if Rosemary actually had his way, he would uh, have never bothered to even claim that he had the intellect to uh, even create those features of any value. So I, I believe that test uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, saves him there. Uh, the second issue which, um, which is of great prominence is the public interest issue. And I'd like to be very entertainingly presented by you. There, there are some kinds of copying that even intellectual property law scholars would lie for. And presently in India we have uh, a a litigation which is what's happening in the academic uh, discussions is about a university being uh, sued by a bunch of publishers and others for levying unfair uh, um, royalty rates actually for uh, or, and charging a photocopier for charging for making reprodu reproductions for photocopying material mm -hmm. post facts. So it has turned into a constitutional debate and so the public interest angle in that area kind of blurs even the understanding of the originality of the course facts, exactly. Uh, so the skill and judgment that was involved in assembling a course fact together mm -hmm. uh, would pass the master of originality as that uh, all the way uh, um, from Fred Brown to say a more democratic standard mm -hmm. in the United States would find the skill and judgment standard there. And whether the publishers would have any right then to claim excessive interest rates or royalty rates mm -hmm. based on say a per for a copy of a course plan in an authorized manner, mm -hmm. or actually charge uh, sections of their works being used uh, mm -hmm. as parts of that. So that's the public interest debate really here, and more so uh, leading towards a fair dealing aspect to balance the right and the duty <coughs> which copyright kind of requires. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about what you're explaining, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm actually quite a fan of the narrative when you bring it back, uh, the emotional content of it. And a total fan of the kind of letters Mr. Rosemary actually writes. So you can imagine he must be a very entertaining speaker. And so while he would probably not want his work to be published, he, there was definitely a market for his work. And he all the way is actually just trying to have friendly terms between two friends and ask, ask, ask them to leave them out because he actually does not like lawsuits or, or, or lawyers for that matter. Uh, so to him, it was more so about almost coming to a stage in modern time and age, and I would want you to comment on it, is if, he, if it was in, within his power to even exercise a right to retract the work 
mm. we would have possibly gone mm -hmm. all out to do that. Mm -hmm. So that would lead towards what is known as author's rights, which is the moral component of copyright, very, very prevalent in continental Europe and borrowed heavily from the French jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> or our <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> Uh, and you know, and uh, India has a stroke take now, but uh, we don't have a Supreme Court judgment underlining that aspect. But we do have a Delhi, Co uh, Delhi High Court judgment of 2005, where we've had a celebrated sculptor uh, uh, awarded head fines as well as uh, allowed to be returned his works for uh, for the way they were mistreated by his by the commissioner. So, mm -hmm. so that's an extension of an exercise of. To what extent would the moral component, which is embedded in the copyright, allow a, a commissioned work to be returned actually, mm. in, uh, despite the payment of already uh, being successful? So I would imagine in today's day and age, uh, it is uh, a cause of worry about uh, the kind of public policy that copyright wants to achieve in certain jurisdictions, mm. especially <coughs> given that we have in India a very strong trading clause which says current awareness and news reporting is actually protected. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, I wanted to quote uh, a particular part about uh, section 52.1 N of the Act, of the Indian Copyright Act, which mentions that reproduction of an article is allowed unless an author has reserved the right to himself of such reproduction. So essentially, mm -hmm. it, it is uh, what I want to highlight is probably in today's uh, day and age, uh, we would have the better say in the matter <laughs> <laughs> than either of the interviewers. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's most fascinating, and I, I'd really like to, uh, to applaud you, is, your, uh, is the postscript that you brought in finally, which actually ends up uh, reflecting even the present geopolitics about having copyright term extensions in favor of investments and otherwise, mm -hmm. say in a free trade agreement, etc., which is coming back very strongly. You would imagine there are several uh, of the out there. <laughs> and uh, I think that upset about and it. if we get that said, then probably you know, the public policy and we need to be reloaded and be with it. So the originality standard has to reflect that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, with I, I just think the only problem is that um, you have these different interest groups. I mean, it, much of copyright um, reform these days, to the extent that it happens, it, it's very much driven by interest groups. And particularly, you mentioned free trade agreements. When you have the, these free trade, these trade negotiations, um, they're being pressured by the large, um, the. Well, they're often being pressured, I'm afraid, by U.S. companies who have a very strong interest in strong copyright protection, which is driving protection up in lots of places. <laughs> so, uh, I open the floor for questions. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, you might want to keep it short and pointed. And if you want any aspect of uh, the address to be probably simplified for you. I think I'm happy to do that. So yes, any questions from the crowd? Yes. I wonder if you could comment, please, on uh, jazz. Uh, I was listening last night to a modern jazz quartet, and uh, they were playing a version of Summertime for Party and Best. And uh, jazz is notorious for doing riffs. A lot of people's work and then going off and coming back. I wonder uh, how much of, of a piece is considered theft, and at what point is it a rip, and at what point is it wholesale thievery? Uh, well, but I'm going to refer you to the work of uh, Richard Arnold, who is, uh, he's actually Sir Richard Arnold, he's a, a high court judge <coughs> in the UK who, um, who's has a lot of uh, expertise in the area from a perspective, the music perspective, as well as um, as a judge specializing in intellectual property, and he's written on this very subject. Uh, the way it, it ends up entirely depending on the particular case, so I can't really give you in the abstract you know, a, a, a clear guideline because it's always case by case. Um, but we have two two questions here, and this is. Uh, this does also highlight this relationship between originality and also infringement, because um, in, under the UK system, you, you, could, you could create something that is both original and infringing. 
at the same time. Um, some systems actually specifically exclude, um, I'm not sure about India, actually specifically exclude uh, protection for, or copyright subsistence from works that are infringing, but in the UK we don't. So first we have to establish, well, is there enough that's being done to this work? Um, is there enough being done to the Gershwin to make it something original um, that would have its own copyright? But then as a separate question we can ask, well, is this, is this taking so much from the original um, Gershwin composition that it is infringing? And the question there is, is it a substantial part? Um, so that's the question we ask, is it a substantial part that's taken from the original? Or uh, do we just have some sort of threads that have been, it, have inspired a new composition entirely? But then in jazz, we get really complicated because as you say, they do these riffs it's something, it's not something that they would necessarily sit down. You have um, the performers themselves contributing, so we have the, the performance element as well. So that's why jazz, excellent question, particularly complicated, particularly challenging to copyright law, and I definitely refer you to Richard Arnold's work on the subject, which is much more knowledgeable than mine. Yes. In your speech, you said I you just you? Sure. sure. So this is um, in, in intellectual property. Um, we we generally talk about striking some kind of balance between the rights of the uh, rights holder and then the public at large, um, which means we carve out exceptions. Um, for example, you know, fair use or fair dealing. Uh, in copyright, we allow certain uses. So, for example, for um, criticism, we we want there to be criticism and review of works, and to rely entirely on the whole owner of the copyright to allow the use of their works in criticism or review. We have a what the economist would call a market failure there because you know, they don't want their works used in ways that might be critical <laughs> of their own works. And yet we as a society want to make sure that does happen. So how do we strike this balance? We create an exception. Um, so we want to encourage certain kinds of uses of works. Once we establish that, that we have to have some balance, we have to have exceptions, then we have to be very careful about saying that any kind of copying is going to be therefore infringing, if you see what I mean. We have to, so to say that what is uh, and, and this, but this has been a compelling argument that if it's worth copying, then it's worth protecting. We have to be very careful about that kind of, you know, essentially circular thinking in, in IP because of the fact that we have to start from this basis of, of uh, believing that some, of, some kinds of copying are okay and we want to encourage, some kinds of copying aren't, and, and what the law has to do is, is not go for these simple solutions to it, but figure out actually which are which. For the public to have access to this in the future. Yeah. Now I wonder if, if he isn't, if he wasn't an interesting man, if his speeches were dull and lackluster, <laughs> would this compelling public interest, is it essentially now a test for aesthetic quality? That's a great question. Okay. So um, one thing I definitely want to clarify is this: this two-part test is not from the law, this is from me. <laughs> so just to be clear, to, you know, lest you write on your exams anything about a two-part test. <laughs> no, the, the, I mean, you can cite me for it as a proposal, but yeah, this is not actually the law. Um, I mean, other than we do see some strands of it in the cases I mentioned, but okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, yes, is there some uh, element of judging what is valuable to the public? Yes, but the point is, there's an element of judging what is valuable to the public in copyright law from the very beginning because we set out the kinds of works that we think are going to be valuable to protect. So by even designating sort of kinds of works, we're making certain judgments. So we cannot avoid making judgments entirely. Um, by saying you know, we want to protect artistic works, we're, we're, by trying to define what is an artistic work, we, we are making judgments there. Um, so it's not avoidable. And I, I suppose um, if we, we, we just have to get back to basics, we have to think, well, if the point of the copyright system, and I have to say, the, the point of the copyright system, the 
the whole rationale for it is not universally agreed upon. But if we, if we start from the perspective of saying, well, the point of the copyright system is to um, encourage the creation of works and maybe to some extent to protect the creators for the good of society, then we do have to make some kind of judgments as to, at a baseline level, what sort of things are we encouraging for the good of society. So that's where I think we wouldn't make, um, so in the Roseberry example, we wouldn't make aesthetic judgments about the particular content of the particular speeches. It would be at a very baseline level of, um, you know, yes, yeah, so they don't have to be interesting. And in fact, I've read them. Many of them aren't very interesting. He was right about that. You know, some of them are all right. Other ones, they really don't hold up. So we're not making a, a sense of a judgment about the quality of the speeches. Um, what I was suggesting is that specifically in the situation where we have to make these really tough determinations of when a copy is going to be original, one of the things we take into consideration is whether making that copy is something that the law should be encouraging. So that's where the public policy comes into it. Is this the kind of copying that the, the law should be encouraging to happen? And then the second element of that is what is the quality of the skill and labor involved in the copying as well. So we have that check on it. Intellectual property, considering that most of these works are based in the same universe mm -hmm. that is created by the original author and use the same characters. Literature yeah. students, and they uh, they worked in the area of genre fiction, and they asked me to come and talk about fan fiction specifically. It's it's an interesting question because um, it's. It tends not to be economically valuable necessarily, though of course um, the, the, <laughs> the unfortunate example of Fifty Shades of Grey <laughs> being incredibly valuable and also starting out as fan fiction. So we see that this can, um, this can uh, be actually an important uh, question from an economic perspective as well. So fan fiction is usually, of course not always, and I think Fifty Shades of Grey is, a, is an example of this, is not always infringing. But it is usually technically infringing. Uh, the creators, um, so the authors of the, um, the, the works that are being infringed, very often let it go. Skill and, skill, labor and um, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be easy to circumvent this by making very minor alterations? to the news article per se, because the news item, is allow you're allowed to copy that. Right, so you're allowed to copy the, the, um, the, this is what we talk about, and this is exactly what Moberly Bell was saying, right, is that he wanted to protect, he wanted to protect the ideas and the facts, as well as the ex literary expression, uh, which was protected um, as the t at the time because of his work. Um, so, uh, so I suppose your, your question is, you have, Easy to circumvent. Is it easy to circumvent? Um, well, yes, but you do have to, to rewrite it. Um, I mean, it, it, and actually that, that I think um, many journalists, you know, it's hard to say, I, this is not something I do on a regular basis myself, but I think that many journalists would actually disagree that it is easy to take somebody else's piece and then turn it into your own words anyway. So um, easy is a judgment call. <laughs> of the time, I'm sorry, I'm being a stickler for being historically accurate about this now, it was not, they were not saying that transferring the kind of work was what made this original or new work. In fact, under the statute, the 1842 Act, it only protected books. So either something was defined as a book or it wasn't. There was a whole lot of separate protection for, or there was a, a statute that provided for protection for speeches specifically, which so you could actually get protection for a speech um, simply, without even writing it down, simply as an oral presentation, if you sort of filed something with the magistrates a couple days in advance. No one ever did this, but you could in theory. 
But that, it wasn't what they were saying was this change of media was not part of their analysis as such. It was, it was just simply, a, was this a, a book that was written by an author? And the court said it was. Um, as far as the law today, um, yes, the, the, mo in most jurisdictions, the law is currently that shifting um, media is infringement um, unless there are specific exceptions carved out for it, which in many cases there are to, you know, to enable you, say, to make, um, well, these days you don't have to rip CDs anymore, but back when you were in my day, <laughs> when, when ripping CDs was something that you wanted to do to put it on your MP3 player, um, then, you know, that was initially infringing until specific exceptions were created for that. If that, does that, does that answer your question? Uh, so if someone, if someone copied, a, um, copied some uh, speech, someone copied this um, uh, lecture right now, mm -hmm. and created a transcript of it, would it still be copyrighted? Uh, okay, so right, so now, um, and I, you're going to have to correct me if I get this wrong, the Indian law, because <coughs> under the UK law, which I think is probably pretty similar, um, it would be that, so this, this lecture is being recorded right now. So even though this gentleman here is the one recording the lecture, uh, I am the author of it. And, uh, and this is now being fixed. So this is being fixed. And it doesn't matter that it's not being fixed by me. So this is under, under the current law. Um, I would now have my copyright in this lecture, which has now been fixed, even though it's somebody else who's doing the fixation. Okay. So the recording could also be the transcript actually. Oh yes. The so difference yeah. really is the intellectual labor, the one who's actually creating it and then uh, being being understood to be the author of that creative work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? I think it was a fascinating lecture. A few uh, several new anecdotes actually about the Atlantic Street Club, right? And uh, putting a lot of personal functions and various character characters that you put up in the street. Uh, it's been a very uh, interesting uh, uh, exchange. This is Professor Irina Gupta, and she has a question for you. <laughs> Um, no, I'm referring to the test that I invented. <laughs> so, <laughs> Any final reflections? <laughs> then I think uh, she was going to turn on the floor.